We are back in downtown Chicago at one of America's most historical living sites, the Lincoln Park Zoo. It's been over a year when we last met up at the Simple Seal Pool, and though I know I've been spoiling you all lately, I guess I might as well just continue to do so and take you to their ace exhibit, the African Journey. Back then it was known as the Large Mammal Building. In preparation for its 2003 reopening, they gutted the place. In a zoo that's 35 acres, you're not going to find any massive, never-ending fields like you did on our last episode. But at nearly 3 acres, they took what used to be an oversimplified cemented showcase and turned it into a tropical oasis filled with natural facades, living plants, and a winding pathway through elements of the jungle that are put together in a way you may never see elsewhere. We've got the savanna. We have the rivers of the rainforest. There's the dry thorn forest. There's life on the rocks, life in the lakes, and it finishes with the savanna. Again, though you won't find any jaw-dropping vistas, just remember here in the African journey, it's what's on the inside that matters. Like almost every exhibit in the Lincoln Park Zoo, there's no special trail that encloses you from seeing other parts of the zoo. So I'll start you off on this journey to its south side next to the macaque forest. The first habitat shows that even a small free city zoo can have its fair share of rare animals. The cunning African painted dog, a richly patterned coat mixed with brown markings to blend in with the savanna grass. They live in a strict hierarchy with both a dominant male and female, with packs that range from 2 to 30 members. They're able to capture semi-larger animals like the gazelle, impala, and even hard-kicking zebras. In fact, their chance of killing is 60%. That's a 40% chance higher than a lion's hunting rate. Lincoln Park Zoo is currently home to a non-breeding pair, but they are still part of the species survival plan, and maybe one day they'll help one of them get a little action. Moving on. From an elevated point on the front of the building, settled below is a dirt alley with the world's most colorful swine, the Red River Hog. Found in forests, savannas, and swamps, they are social animals that live in groups up to 15 individuals and they call themselves the Sounders. As you can clearly see, they are mainly active at night. When they're younger and startled, they're one of the few animals that also plays possum or plays dead. I'd really like to see if that even works, but if it does, better hope it's near water because they are in fact great swimmers. They may be pretty to look at. I mean, it helps them blend in the mud and predators are usually colorblind to red and orange colors. But what are they useful for? Well, other than being somebody else's food, they search for their own for most of their lives by breaking up and loosening the ground soil with their tusks, snouts, and even just their feet, causing the ground to be able to breathe a little, and it also causes seed dispersal. In the wild, they live to be approximately 15 years, but can continue to stay pretty in zoos for about 20. Now there's nothing left to do but go through the doors in an entrance that's meant to resemble the old, currently under construction Lion House. Just from looking at its outside, you'd never guess how large it appears to be from the inside. The first hallway isn't exactly your ticket to an African region, but it does give a teaser of what's to come. The actual portal are the doors halfway through the path. At first you're in a research station, but 10 steps into it, you're somewhere completely different. Perhaps the face of the journey, an atrium where light and night naturally takes up the space. The beginning of the forest section, a landscape that makes the animals look over you from their canopy. It may not be entirely and immediately noticeable from the footage, but we're looking at two exhibits. The front and open section is a walkthrough aviary called the Winged in the Wetlands. The Abdon Stork, the smallest of the 19 species of their kind. There's the African Spoonbill, a waning bird that will use its beak to locate prey in murky water by snapping and sweeping back and forth until it hits something. Then there's the Hadada Ibis, my personal favorite of the bunch for some reason. They're one of the few birds titled for its three note calls that sounds like it's trying to say its own name. And then lastly, you can't forget about the tiny hot and tot teals that take up the bottom half. Now behind them all what used to be strictly colobus monkeys are now diana monkeys. 
a West African native that's much more active than their former roommates, but they're also harder to film. Like seen here, they spend their lives in the trees, but rarely make nests to actually sleep in. And no, someone named Diana didn't just come along, discover them, and give the monkey their name. Rather, they're actually named for their crescent-shaped white brow band that resembles the crescent of the brow on the Roman goddess Diana, the protector of wildlife and woodlands. Under the massive tree we go, that acts as an entrance to a cave. The rocks on the side have a few gaping holes that allows water to flow through. This one is glass fronted but open topped on the backside to allow the jungle to form the landscape. This is home to several dwarf crocodiles, but unfortunately none were in place to film. The cave gets darker as you go and embedded in one of the trunks is a large floor to ceiling panel. Inside the hollow are countless Madagascar hissing cockroaches. But a little over to the far side, settled in between two trunks and in front of a dimly lit savanna, is a golden orb spider that has no barriers and nothing stops them from wandering off. You're then emerged from the caves, catching a brief hint of sunlight as you view the elevated fishing huts of Cameroon before being taken back into the shadows once more to a roaring riverbank. Similar to the crocodile exhibit, this offers a continual look below and above the water. Like their sisters in Brookfield, Lincoln Park too has the pygmy hippopotamus. Amidst the brush and rivers, they live an undercover life. Unlike their cousins, the pygmies are solitary, which can benefit their survival. With a wider, more dispersed range, there's less of a chance the population will diminish from human involvement. That may not be working so much though, because unlike their savannah cousins, they are sadly endangered. Here they have a ton of water and very little land. Sounds ideal for a hippo, but these guys are actually more terrestrial. Last fact before we go, they may be one eighth smaller than a common hippo, but they are five times cuter. Now things start to get a little less humid, a little more dry, and a lot louder. Ahead is a narrow, rocky, outcropped exhibit with low elevation and branches that go towards the fence, allowing whatever can fly to get up close. You'd find a red-billed hornbill, Kenyan crested guinea fowl, blue-bellied rollers, and the main attraction, the Clip Springer. It's dark at the Lincoln Park area, but luckily their neighbors to the west have them as well. Females are larger than males, but the males have horns that can reach an impressive length of four inches. As these exhibits showed, the Clip Springer was made for the rocks, mountains, and river gorges. They are considered a dwarf antelope, measuring 20 inches in height and only weighing 25 pounds. The path continues towards a median point between sections. It's a small rounded hut that gives a preview of one of the final displays. But for now, things are going to get even drier. Welcome to the Thorn Forest. Dense, shrub-like vegetation found in dry, subtropical and temperate areas. In this simulated case, it finds its way into the savanna woodland during the rainy season and creeps towards the desert as the climate dries up. And here there are three exhibits, two behind glass railings. The first comes with a termite mountain and cave. This would be home to their meerkats. Ahead of them is another burrowing animal, the elephant-related aardvark that I've still yet to clearly see. And if you somehow haven't noticed yet, there's something pretty tall behind them. A clever design and the inspiration for this video's thumbnail. Past the window and in the boma, believe it or not, you're actually kind of looking at a decently rare animal. This is the Baringo or Rothschild's giraffe. They are classified as endangered and have a wild population of over 1,600 individuals. Now I talk like they're never heard of in zoos, but with a captive population of nearly 500, that makes them the second most commonly displayed giraffe. Now on to the building's final region the Rift Valley Lake. In reality, the Rift Valleys are formed when the eastern and western subplates of Africa move in opposite directions, which can lead to volcanic activity. The lakes were created hundreds of thousands of years ago when the valleys on the faults filled with water. Like here, they're filled with an abundant amount of colorful fish. The most prominent are cichlids. There are more than 3,000 kinds of them. Here at the Lincoln Park Zoo, this is 25,000 gallons, perfectly framed with rock, and has a dimly lit viewing so you can see their scales luminate in the light. 
I may have said it's what's on the inside that matters, but we're still not quite done. Those giraffes don't live inside forever. Just outside the door is what's properly known as the African savanna. At roughly 16,000 square feet, it is the largest individual habitat at the zoo. Rightfully as it should be since it contains not only the world's tallest animal, but also the plain zebra, the most geographically widespread of this black and white hoof stock. They're more distinguishable from the others by their wider stripes that also extend to touch each other on the belly from either side. The zoo is home to two younger males that came in 2018. But we are still not done. That was actually located in the middle of the journey, but there are habitats that are spread all the way around the backside. What used to contain elephants? There are three simple paddocks for the critically endangered eastern black rhinoceros. I'll save the rhino facts for another time because this is what I really wanted to show you. After a 15 month pregnancy and a relatively quick labor, the zoo's female Kapuki gave birth in May of 2019. After 53 minutes of age, this little guy, later named Romeo, was able to take his first steps. As the zoo says, scientifically, he is the cutest calf on the planet, and he made his outdoor debut in June, so unfortunately my friend and I weren't able to catch him. And our journey ends with him. A building that once housed six species reopened with 29 after a $23 million renovation. Overall, it may not only be the Lincoln Park's greatest exhibit, but I believe it outmatches the others in creativity and innovation, despite it being over 15 years old and several attractions have opened after it. So the AZA was fair in awarding the zoo for significant achievement in design in 2005 for this journey. It may not have been a safari on the savanna, but it's sometimes nice to see the smaller, forgotten of Africa's forests, lakes, and deserts. Before we go, please go to the description, read the rules, and vote on what zoo or aquarium you'd like to see get featured on Zoo Tours. Thank you for watching.